march our way along, keeping track of a vector of r coefficients of h as we go. And the initial vector is very easy to compute because when k is negative, all of those coefficients are zero because these are polynomials. And we can compute the very first, the, very, the, the one non-zero coefficient we want is h sub zero to the n. And we can compute that very quickly h sub, using binary exponentiation, especially if we're working in a finite field, although these are just sort of formal definitions that we're thinking about over z at the, for the moment. Okay, so that was sort of just the general setup. And this will be a very useful slide to remember, and it's okay if you forget it, because when you come to week three, I'm very sure David Harvey is gonna have a slide that looks almost exactly like this when he starts talking about average polynomial times for computing zeta functions. This is sort of the fundamental uh, recurrence that gets used over and over again. Of course, things get a lot more interesting when there's more than one polynomial floating around, or you're not working with a polynomial in one variable. Okay, we're, we're gonna, today, we're just gonna focus on the absolute simplest case, where now we wanna specialize to the case where h is our cubic polynomial f that defines our elliptic curve y squared equals f of x. So h is, so r is 3 from now on. We're not going to worry about r anymore. We're always going to be working with r as just 3. So we have a cubic polynomial. We're going to assume that the constant coefficient of f is not 0. In fact, if it turned out to be 0, that would be good news. We could make the algorithm faster, but let's, just to keep everything simple, we'll just say, well, if it is 0, replace f of x with f of x plus 1. And if you're in characteristic 3, where it's potentially too small to, to, for that to be guaranteed to work, go count points using our naive algorithm because we're only talking about finite fields. And the n that we're interested in, the superscript on all of, in, in this screen, this was completely generic. It would work for every n. But the n we want is p minus 1 over 2 because recall that the, the Haas invariant is the coefficient of x to the p minus 1 in the nth power of f where n is p minus 1 over 2. And so our goal for computing the Haas invariant is to compute f sub p minus 1 superscript n. That's, that's the coefficient we're after. Okay. And so now we're going to do, we're just going to modify this linear relation a little bit. So this linear relation as it stands now, equation 1, has an n in it. Um, not just in the superscript, but actually an n. The integer n is appearing in this uh, as a coefficient in the relation. And we'd like to get rid of that. Okay, for reasons that'll become clear later. And so there's sort of a, a clever way to get rid of that would be to multiply the numerator and the denominator of the right-hand side by two. That's why I wrote this strange thing, wrote, multiply it by two over two. And so we get an, a two showing up in the denominator. And we had a two times n plus one in, inside the sum and, but we're ultimately only going to be re-interested in what's happening modulo p, because remember the Haas invariant is something that's defined over fp. It's only, we only, it only makes sense modulo p, and when we reduce modulo p, the n just disappears. Okay, so that was the, the, the reason for mod multiplying the numerator and the denominator by 2. We get a slightly simpler um, expression, okay, because 2n plus 2 is 1 mod p. Okay. And if we now define our initial vector, which you know you, we should secretly be thinking about as 0, 0, f sub 0 to the n, but it'll actually be convenient because we want to have a relation that really doesn't have any n's in it at all. I'm going to write it as just 0, 0, 1, and we'll throw in the nth power of the constant coefficient of f later. So we're going to consider a, a, an initial vector, or the, the vector that we're going to be moving along through our linear recurrence, 0, 0, 1. And then we have a three by three matrix that expresses the recurrence relation that's written directly, directly above. Okay, so we just, just, you can just write down this matrix from looking at this relation. Of course, I, we have a denominator of two times k, two kf of zero that we need to worry about. So it's important that k is not zero and this is why we wanted f zero to not be zero so that we're not dividing by zero. But since we're eventually computing, interested in what's happening modulo p, well, if we're gonna, we're gonna end up computing a product of p minus one of these matrices, of these m sub k's. Why p minus one? Because we're trying to move from f sub zero up to f sub p minus one. And so we need to apply this recurrence relation p minus one times. But if we take the product of 2k f, f sub zero, as k goes from one to p minus one, we get just minus one mod p, right? Because Fermat's little theorem, and then we're taking p minus one factorial mod p is just minus one. And this implies, this now gives us a formula for computing the Haas invariant. 
we, we, we want to, we're going to compute the coefficient of uh, x to the p minus 1 in, in the nth power of f modulo p using this by applying our linear, linear recurrence, applying it to, to v naught, our starting vector, and then multiplying by minus f, f uh, the constant coefficient of f raised to the nth power. And, that'll be, and that will give us a sequence of three adjacent coefficients of f to the nth power, and it's the last entry is the one we want. f sub p minus 1 superscript n is exactly the coefficient we're looking for. That's where the Hasse invariant is. Okay. Any questions on any of this? Okay, great. I mean, hopefully this seems like blindingly simple to you. <laughs> okay, yeah, question. Sorry, say that again? Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. This is potentially a lot of matrices to multiply. In fact, we can say exactly how many matrices we have to multiply, P minus one of them. Yeah, so that's our next, that's our next task, is to multiply a bunch of matrices. Um, but I'll also note that we're actually trying to compute a, a vector times a bunch of matrices. And so at least if we were really going to do it step by step, one at a time, we'd, better, we'd be better off doing a vector matrix multiplication all the way along. Multiply this vector times the first matrix, that gives us another vector, multiply it by the next matrix. So at least we're doing you know, vector matrix multiplication rather than matrix matrix multiplication. Of course, all of this is O of 1, right? 3 by 3 is O of 1. So we're not going to worry about things like what's the complexity of matrix multiplication. I mean, there are 3 by 3 matrices. It certainly doesn't take more than however many, you know, whatever number of multiplications you want to spend, it's going to be O of 1 in our complexity bound. Okay. All right, but this, I, I think this, this one slide or this example really captures um, what lie, underlies all of the algorithms, all of the average polynomial time algorithms for computing zeta functions are in some sense expressed in this slide. And sort of the, the key was getting rid of the, any dependence on n and p in this expression. We're going to apply it mod p first, but you'll notice that the, the matrix m sub k doesn't have any p's in it. It just has coefficients of f and it has indices k. And, it's, and I could use the m sub, same m sub k modulo many different primes p. The matrix is not going to change if we were to imagine that f was actually an integer polynomial. But let's first focus just on, let's, let's not try to do two things at once. Let's first just focus on the simpler problem. I have a specific elliptic curve over fp defined by y squared equals f of x, and I want to compute its Hasse invariant. How would we do that using this method? Okay. It's not going to be as fast as Mestre's algorithm. I'll, 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 the spoiler alert, we're not going to get a faster algorithm. But it's useful to understand how this algorithm works because once you go to higher uh, genus curves, it actually will give a faster algorithm than any other algorithms we know. Okay. okay. So let's first just consider the completely straightforward, as we did with our naive point counting algorithm, our first algorithm will be, let's just compute directly from the definition. So we have an expression here, expression equation two, that tells us how to compute the Haas invariant. What if we just applied that equation? So what would happen? We get an algorithm to compute the Haas invariant using vector matrix multiplication. It takes as input a monic square-free cubic polynomial over FP that defines an elliptic curve. The fact that it's square-free guarantees that with non-zero constant coefficient. We compute our initial vector 0, 0, 1, and then let k go, in, go from 1 to p minus 1, and we just iteratively replace our, our vector v with v times m sub k, the next matrix in the list. So we're just going to march along, applying our linear, linear recurrence until we've done it p minus 1 times. And then when we have, we have a vector with three entries, and recall that it was the last entry we wanted, the third entry. So we're going to take the third entry of v, multiply it by minus f sub 0 to the n, but I've put in parentheses around the f sub 0 to remind you that no, no, don't, don't, you don't need to compute f to the n and then take the constant coefficient. Take the constant coefficient and just raise it to the nth power. Okay. Um, and so what's the time complexity of this? Well, we're doing basically O of 1 ring operations uh, at each step, and we're doing P minus 1 steps. Okay, so the complexity is going to be essentially P multiplications in FP, and the complexity of multiplying two elements of FP, because we know integer multiplication has complexity O of N log N, it's going to be P times log P log log P. Okay. 
Now there's a couple things you can do to improve the constant factors. Um, one thing is when we're going from one matrix to the next, rather than evaluating doing multiplications to compute the matrix entries, because the matrices themselves are just li are just linear shifts of each other, we could compute them each successive matrix using finite differences. And the fact that there are a lot of zeros in this matrix, although it's only three by three, so there aren't so many. But imagine this were like a hundred by hundred version of the same thing. There would be a whole lot of zeros because there's only going to be you know whatever the dimension is. It's linear a linear number of non-zero entries. Okay, so I'm only these actually absolutely make no difference in the elliptic curve case. But for higher genus curves, these optimizations are are, are quite useful. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the algorithm. Um, not that one. This one. Okay. So the algorithm, this is a case where the algorithm looks a little bit more complicated on in when implemented. This is a magma implementation than it did on the slides. But that's in part because I went to the trouble of actu actually implementing the optimizations that I mentioned. Okay, so what is this doing? It's taking as input um, an elliptic curve E. <clears throat> it's first figuring out what finite field we're working over, what's the base ring of E, and what's its cardinality. And because we're, our goal is to count points on E, we can only do that when P is bigger than 13. Otherwise, knowing the trace of Frobenius mod P is not enough. But we'll just farm that out to an algorithm we've already implemented when, when P is smaller than 13. We're then going to get the cubic polynomial F that defines E, the call, the, the Weierstrass model function here, actually should really be called short Weierstrass model. It's going to put our elliptic curve in the form Y squared equals X cubed plus AX plus B. And the function hyperelliptic polynomials just asks for uh, a pair of polynomials that define E, but once we've put it in this Y squared equals X cubed plus AX plus B, there's just one that we care about and we'll call that F. That's F is our cubic polynomial. Now, there's no guarantee it has zero constant coefficient, so we're just going to make it not, uh, it doesn't have non-zero constant coefficient, we're going to make it non-zero by just com com uh, con continually shifting f, replace, replacing f of x with f of x plus 1 until the constant coefficient is non-zero. And this is guaranteed to work because f is a cubic and we already know we're in characteristic bigger than 13. So there's definitely enough, enough elements of fp floating around for this to work. And this parent f.1 here is just a way of finding out what is the variable, the indeterminant, the x, in the polynomial ring that f lives in. Okay, my function here never defined x, so if I just wrote an x here, it wouldn't work. In GP, it would. That's the magic of GP. You can, you can just create an x out of thin air without ever having to define it. Okay, so this is giving us our, our polynomial f. We're then going to set up our initial vector, 0, 0, 1, which I want to live in FP, so all the arithmetic is happening in FP, so this is 